Please remain standing. I'm Stephen Toop, and I have the honor to serve as President and Vice Chancellor of the University of British Columbia. We're gathered here today to acknowledge the achievements of a great person, Dr. Amartya Sen, 1998 Nobel Prize winner for Economic Sciences, and to confer upon him an honorary degree. At this time, please join us in the singing of O Canada, led by our university marshal, Professor Nancy Hermiston, director of the opera and voice program at the UBC School of Music. Thank you very much, Nancy. At this time, I'd like to invite Mrs. Mary Charles from the Musqueam Indian Band to provide a welcome on behalf of the Musqueam. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so very honored to be here this afternoon to welcome you to Vancouver, the University of British Columbia, and our Musqueam traditional territory. My home is on the Musqueam Reservation about five minutes from here, but I'm a little embarrassed to say I got lost coming out here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so very honored to be here with all our, our guests, our honored guests. And as we do in our tradition, I'll start our afternoon with a little prayer. <clears throat> Thank you, Great Spirit, for this new day. So much like yesterday, and yet so very special. Thank you for family, friends, casual acquaintances, and strangers I meet only once. They're all part of your plan and in my life for a reason. Bless them today, Great Spirit, as you meet their needs and guide them accordingly to your will. Let us be one with our brothers and sisters in love and peace. Make us strong mentally, physically, and spiritually to lead the way for future generations and make this world a better place to live. May all your blessings and kindness be bestowed on everyone here this afternoon. Near or far, together or apart, Keep our loved ones close until we meet again. May your days be rich with joy. May your successes be frequent. May you have peace and comfort. And may your hearts know just how great you all are. Haichka. Haichka in my dialect is thank you. I thank you all for this great honor. Haichka. Haichka. Thank you very much, Mrs. Charles. Please be seated. Dr. Sen, by being here this afternoon and by accepting this honorary degree, you are doing the University of British Columbia a great honor and an important service. 
you are reminding the community beyond our walls that a great university has an important role to play in the search for solutions to the world's problems. Your own extraordinary contributions to those solutions stand as object lessons to people everywhere, and especially within UBC, because you inspire us to think about the links between fundamental research and concrete action. That's one of the chief functions of a university, to provide students and scholars with the opportunity to explore the frontiers of knowledge and to turn that knowledge into beneficial action for the people of our own community and for the people of the world. Thank you, Dr. Sen, for joining us today, for challenging us, and above all, for inspiring us. I'd like now to invite Dr. David Farrar, Provost and Vice President Academic of the University of British Columbia, to formally introduce our honorary degree recipient, Dr. Farrar. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chancellor. Every year at Congregation, UBC has the honor of bestowing honorary degrees upon individuals who, in the opinion of the university community, have fit the criteria of excellence and eminence in their chosen field. On very rare occasions, we have the opportunity of conferring honorary degrees outside of congregation, and this is one of those occasions. Amartya Sen is a rare individual, and I invite him to step forward now to receive his honorary degree. Mr. Vice Chancellor, a passion for understanding and improving society has driven Amartya Sen's success in the fields of economics, philosophy, and decision theory. An innovator in social choice theory, welfare economics, development economics, uh, public health, gender studies, and the economics of war and peace, Dr. Sen's research has touched many fields and is deeply influenced by the social imagination of the poet Rabatranath Tagore. Asia's first Nobel laureate, Dr. Sen has consistently demonstrated the necessity and applicability of humanist ideas in social policy and practice. Best known for his work to understand the mechanisms of poverty and famine, Dr. Sen's ideas have turned into action, for example, by helping to develop solutions for, presenting, for preventing and minimizing the effects of food shortages. Challenging the idea that only self-interest motivates human activity, Dr. Zen is internationally known for his groundbreaking research on social choice theory. Using ideas he exploited in development economics, Dr. Zen has been a driving force behind United Nations policy. His work has been used to measure poverty and inequality around the world and to provide information on improving economic conditions for the poor. Recognized globally for his ideas and work on welfare economics, he is the recipient of the 1998 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. Was named to the Order of Companion of Honor in the United Kingdom and has received the award of Bharat Ratna, the highest honor awarded by the President of India. Currently, the Thomas W. Lamont University Professor and Professor of Economics and Philosophy at Harvard University, Dr. Sen is also a Senior Fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows, a Fellow of Trinity College, Cambridge. He has taught at the University of Calcutta, Delhi University, the London School of Economics, Harvard University, and Oxford University, on a visiting basis at MIT, Stanford, Berkeley, and Cornell. Mr. Vice Chancellor, for his efforts to empower us with knowledge in a troubled world and for continuing the inspirational work of Rabatranath Tagore, I ask you to confer the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa on Amartya Kumar Sen.
I'd like to invite Dr. Hillel Goldman, Chair of the Interdisciplinary Studies Graduate Program at UBC, to come forward and introduce Dr. Sen. Thank you, Dr. Farrar. Dr. Amartya Sen once wrote, while I am interested both in economics and in philosophy, the union of my interests in the two fields far exceeds their intersection. This short sentence is probably the best definition of interdisciplinary research that I've ever come across. It conveys the importance of attaining a high level of rigor in one's home disciplines and the ability to weave that rigor with the knowledge, understanding, and wisdom of other disciplines in the creation of new questions and new solutions. I believe that the students in the Interdisciplinary Studies Graduate Program at UBC invited Professor Amartya Sen to speak as part of our 40th anniversary celebration because they see in Professor Sen a model of rigor and creativity to which they aspire in their own programs of research, especially as they pertain to compelling social issues such as justice, poverty, and equity. Since the inception of the ISGP in 1971, our 300 alumni have addressed complex and important research questions. Our current student body of over 100 students is working with faculty supervisors from nearly 40 different departments at UBC. They are studying such diverse topics as child-headed families in Rwandan refugee camps, the creation of new cost-effective and environmentally friendly wood laminate products, the prevention of HIV AIDS among at-risk populations in Thailand, the success of the safe injection sites in Vancouver, and the harnessing of social capital to reduce human exposure to pesticides in Ecuador. Their research exemplifies Dr. Sen's view that interdisciplinary research, quote, far exceeds the intersection of two or more disciplines, unquote. For 40 years, the ISGP has built strong collaborative partnerships with other units on the UBC campus, and we are delighted to co-sponsor Dr. Sen's visit with the Institute of Asian Research in recognition of the 100th birthday of Tagore. And I extend my very best wishes and congratulations to the Bengali community and to others on this occasion. It is therefore my honor and my privilege to introduce Dr. Amartya Sen. Um, and I'm very honored indeed to be here today uh, on this occasion. And it is wonderful for me to become affiliated to this remarkably distinguished university in this marvelous way. 
I have had the privilege of working together over many decades now with um, many members of the UBC faculty, particularly in social choice theory. And I've greatly benefited from these associations as well as from the high quality of research, sometimes pioneering work carried out by academics in different fields at this university. I deeply appreciate the further and in some ways closer connection with the UBC that the conferment of an honorary degree gives to me. I'm extremely grateful for it. The immediate occasion for our get together today is the celebration of the 40th anniversary of the Interdisciplinary Studies graduate program at the UBC. While looking back at the marvelous history of this innovative program, we have reason to reflect on the intellectual argument behind this imaginative initiative that took us beyond the narrow confines of each separate discipline. That subject and those arguments are the main uh, topic of my brief talk. There is, however, another occasion of which I've been asked to take note, namely the 150th anniversary of the birth of the great poet and writer Rabindranath Tagore. These are, at one level, two quite unrelated subjects. Rabindranath Tagore would have been 110 years old when the Interdisciplinary Studies Graduate Program was initiated at the UBC. And since he had died many decades earlier, there was no direct interaction between Tagore <laughs> and UBC's interdisciplinary departure, as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> Further, uh, he, Tagore did not write extensively on interdisciplinary higher education per se. But there is, in fact, a strong indirect connection between Tagore's intellectual priorities and the motivation underlying interdisciplinary initiatives in general. This is because Tagore's passion for breaking down the barriers that sequester our thinking into separate compartments has a clear relevance to the argument behind pursuing knowledge and intellectual relations that cut across disciplinary boundaries. Indeed, the recognition of this connection gives us a handle to appreciate what interdisciplinary education can, seen in this broad perspective on non-segregationist understanding of the world in which we live, do for us, and how it can motivate our work. Before I go into the rationale for interdisciplinary education, let me first say a few words on the importance of what, we, what might be thought to be the exact opposite, namely the virtue of strictly discipline-based education. I do not think that the two, that is discipline-centered education and interdisciplinary pursuits, really pull us in opposite directions yielding some kind of a battle of two allegedly contradictory understandings of the pursuit of human knowledge. Indeed, I do not believe that we can champion interdisciplinary education by trying to dig the grave of specialized education. We can go confidently beyond, in an informed way, the respective boundaries of good disciplines only if the discipline themselves and our education in them are good and robust. It's very important to acknowledge first how much the world of knowledge and understanding has benefited from the high quality of work that has been accomplished over a number of centuries, respectively, within different disciplines. We might, for example, like our medical researchers and practitioners to know something about human psychology and the broad impact of what they do, but we would undoubtedly be somewhat disappointed to see the list if our doctors did not know medical science very well in the first place. In fact, when I was thinking last week about today's celebration 
and my talk here. I could not help recollecting the day after having just arrived at Harvard across the Atlantic when I was waiting to see my new doctor in his room. He wasn't still there. I went around while waiting the diplomas and other acknowledgement of honors. My do new doctor um, that I could find hanging on the walls of his room. This was more than 20 years ago, in fact, 24 years ago. But I recollect the jolt I received when the first degree certificate I saw on the wall of my doctor, whom I had not yet met, was an acknowledgement that he got a Harvard summa from the Department of Sanskrit. <laughs> I was, of course, totally terrified. I was impressed that he had expertise in Sanskrit, a language and literature to which I've been loyal throughout my life since the age of five. But I did want my doctor to know some medicine as well. <laughs> of course, I remember immediately the good writings of ancient Indian medical scientists like Charaka and Susuta more than 2,000 years ago. But I did think that a bit of modern medicine could come in rather handy. <laughs> As it turned out, my doctor had many other qualifications as well, from medical institution to reputation, as a voyage around his wall soon revealed. He also proved to be, over the years, to be a very good practicing doctor. Armed with this further knowledge, I was very happy indeed at my doctor's expertise in Sanskrit. And it really was interesting to talk with him, in addition to medicine, also about his take on what he had got out of Oriental studies. My understanding of his good disciplinary expertise in medicine had by then transformed my reaction to his interdisciplinary commitment from one of real terror to one of absolute thrill. If there's a moral in this story, it is that interdisciplinary work demands disciplinary foundations. Indeed, when specialized education and research first emerged in the form of sound pursuit of different disciplines, something of real importance was achieved that the earlier history of undifferentiated quest for knowledge could not provide. We have historical signs of the remains of the earlier non-specialized intellectual history in the academic language that survives even to our own day. Postgraduate education in an extraordinarily wide variety of subjects is still acknowledged by the degree of doctor of philosophy in the form of a PhD or a DPhil, no matter how unphilosophical the candidate's work um, or his disciplinary subject might be. This reminds us of the time, long time ago, when philosophy stood for much of academic inquiry in general, encompassing a whole gamut of particular subjects or disciplines. Discipline-based specialized pursuit of knowledge gradually took us beyond the limitations of the lack of specialization, beyond the limitations um, of the lack of specialization. And that route has achieved a lot of human knowledge and understanding in a huge variety of subjects in the intellectual history of the world, not just in Europe and America, but also in, in, in the rest of the world. The case for interdisciplinary work has to be seen only after that debt to disciplinary education and research is adequately acknowledged. Now the question that arises is this. If disciplinary education is so good, so important, then why do we need to go beyond it at all? There are many plausible answers to this question, but I will concentrate on only two of them here. I would be happy to talk about some others if, and if they come up in the Q&A time. People probably don't know here. There are going to be Q&A at the end of it. <laughs> the first problem with purely discipline-based education is that many fields of inquiry and many topics we have reason to pursue do not fit well or at all within the rigid boundaries of any particular subject. Even as we see the strong argument for pursuing the medical sciences from 
medicine to sur surgery with specialized dedication, as I argued earlier, the use of medical expertise cannot but benefit from knowledge of and interest in many other concerns, from psychology to sociology, and dare I say, even economics. Indeed, some subjects, and this does include economics, cannot be fully appreciated without invoking and making use of types of reasoning that other disciplines, different from the narrowly defined secreted subjects, sequestered subjects, have made us understand better. Let me clarify what I'm saying with a concrete example. The origin of modern economics can, most economists seem to accept, be traced to the pioneering work of Adam Smith in the 18th century, particularly to his book, The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776. When Smith in, went into economics, um, I'm sorry, uh, in, uh, no, Smith was, in fact, professor of moral philosophy at the University of Glasgow. When he went into economics, and there were others earlier than him to do this, like Aristotle, or Cotillia, or Petty, or Quenet, he was not, of course, still within the confines of moral philosophy. Of that, there is no doubt. He was opening up a new way of understanding economic relations that would have a profound impact on economic thinking. In short, what modern economics was being founded. However, while this was a new subject, I knew it certainly was, Smith was not in any sense denying the relevance of moral philosophy to economic reasoning. Many of the major misunderstandings, misunderstandings of the lessons to draw from Smith's pioneering work have arisen from trying to segregate economics from moral philosophy altogether. Misinterpretation of Smith's analysis of reasons for action has been a rampant feature of 20th century economics, alas. For example, in two well-known and forcefully argued papers, the famous Chicago economist George Stigler, who was one of the early recipients of the Nobel Prize in economics, has presented his quote-unquote self-interest theory, including the belief, I quote from uh, uh, Stigler, self-interest dominates the majority of men, which he attributes, I quote again, to be on Smithian lines, unquote. This is a misunderstanding, but Stigler was not really alone or idiosyncratic in the, this diagnosis. This is indeed the standard view of Smith that has been powerfully promoted by many writers who constantly invoke Smith to support their belief in the unique rationality of the profit motive. If you do something for anyone else, this can be rational in this theory only if you get something from it yourself. Following that odd presumption in modern economics, the alleged view of Smith, even though entirely implanted, have invaded neighboring disciplines as well, and a whole generation of rational choice political analysis and experts in so-called law and economics have been cheerfully practicing the same narrow art. There's no room in this quote-unquote as if Smith for generosity, for social commitment, for public spirit, values the reasonable of which, reasonableness of which Smith discussed in great detail in the theory of moral sentiment and used in his book in, in, in The Wealth of Nations. I've taken the liberty of suggesting on another occasion that this reduction of Smith, that while small, some men are born small and some achieve smallness, it's clear that Adam Smith has that much smallness thrust upon him. <laughs> the puzzling thing about this is that it is contradicted by what Smith said again and again in his work. It's also very, it is also the very first sentence saying this of his first book, published in 1759, The Theory of Moral Sentiment, which I was privileged to write a new introduction for, which came out as the 250th anniversary edition by Penguin Books. Uh, in this book, That Theory of Moral Sent Sentiment, Smith 
um, uh, which was, by the way, his first book, 1759, also his last book, 1790. In between came theory, moral sentiment. He went on revising it, but not in this respect. So we have a fairly rare case of an evidence that he believed in it at the beginning and at the end, even while all that economic writing, quote unquote, um, has taken place, and in which he still doesn't depart from that view, which people tend to forget. But it's interesting that the, that theory of moral sentence, the very first sentence, I can, I can say that you missed the sentence tucked away in chapter 37, but this is the way the, sent, the book begins. I quote the first sentence of, the, of Smith's first book. How so a selfish man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortunes of others and render their happiness necessary to him though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it." Unquote. One reason for the interpretational confounding, and it's a major confounding, is the tendency to confuse the question of the adequacy of self-interest as a motivation with a much narrower question, what motivation is needed to explain why people seek exchange in a market economy? Smith famously discussed this, and this is about two pages, which seem to be pretty much all the Smith that many people read these days, involving the baker, the butcher, and brewer. They don't need any concern for others to be able to want to have, it, have trade. But in that, he was answering a specific question, why people seek trade. And for that, you, do not work, have, you don't have to say that a baker has to be um, ethically motivated in order to sell, want to sell bread. That's a very, very narrow question. Concerned with exchange, not with distribution, production, and concerned with motivation for exchange, not even how to make exchange sustainable. The, the point that Semnitz is making in these two pages is a fine point about motivation for trade. It's not a very central point in his book, excepting that it has become such a central thing by being the only thing um, that's quoted. By the way, when I moved to Harvard, I had a problem that in, when I was teaching earlier in Delhi or Oxford or Cambridge, uh, you, you gave students readings, and then in one of the courses I was teaching, I was told that you haven't marked the paid numbers. And I mentioned that, well, you have to find. You skim through it and decide what you want to read. So I was told, no, that is not the Harvard Convention. You have to give the page number 37 to 39 or something. <laughs> and this idea that you spend the rest of your life, someone giving you <laughs> which pages to read, is um, um, remarkable. And if I may m move away from my skip for a second, I was, at the end, we have this marvelous thing. Students write wonderful reports at the end. They also mark you. They're usually very kind. But they also make comments as to how I improve my lectures. And <laughs> one of them said that Professor said that in his earlier universities, uh, they didn't give paid numbers. But he should recognize he had moved to Harvard. And in Harvard, we are given specific page numbers to read. <laughs> <laughs> so since then, I've been trying to improve my lectures. <laughs> um, so Smith discussed. Um, how the functioning of the economic systems in general, including distribution and production, and of the markets in particular, can be enormously helped by motives that go well beyond self-love. As it happens, this issue, well discussed by Smith in the mid-18th century, is of great interest in analyzing many economic crises of market-based economies that the world has experienced over the centuries, including, as it happens, the recent one, that began in the fall of 2008, which is still somewhat overwhelming for us. In The Wealth of Nations, Smith considers a variety of economic problems. For some of them, the guidance of what he called rather disparagingly self-love is entirely adequate. But for other economic engagements, self-love is not the solution, but the problem. For example, in inducing some people to cut corners and to take excessive risk with the hope of quickly making a lot of profit. Smith diagnosed, analyzing this, a tendency towards over-speculation 
that often tends to grip many human beings in their breathless search for immediate gains. Smith called these promoters of excessive risk in search of profits, prodigals, and projectors, which, by the way, is quite a good description of the recent entrepreneurs of credit swap insurances and subprime mortgages in our own time in the United States. And he discussed it in some detail there. The important boundaries that these entrepreneurs transgressed involved a departure from the standard rule-oriented behavior, which are not guided only by self-interest, that Smith thought was the norm in most economic relations. People follow rules not by saying each time how do I justify it, but these exist rules. Of course, behind that there is some reasoning. But the first thing is that these are the rules we are following. Smith points to motivational variation between people and the need to take them into account in devising state policies and economic programs. Unwavering faith in the wisdom of a standalone market economy, which is largely responsible for the removal of the established regulation in the United States, uh, began by President Reagan, but continued even under Democratic president, which paved the way to the economic crisis of 2008 and 9. All this has tended to assume away the activities of prodigals and projectors in a way that would have shocked the pioneering exponent of the rationale of the market economy. As Smith warned, relying entirely on an unregulated market economy can result in a dire predicament in which, I quote, Smith, quote from Smith, a great part of the capital of the country will be kept out of the hands which were most likely to make a profitable and advantageous use of them and thrown into those which were most likely to waste or destroy it, unquote. In understanding the nature of financial stability of a country, it's also extremely important to pay attention to Smith's argument that not so much immediate self-seeking, but trust in each other, it's a different kind of moral uh, reasoning, plays a hugely important part. A quote from Smith, when the people of a particular country have such confidence in the fortune, poverty, and prudence of a particular banker as to believe he is always ready to pay upon demand such of his promissory notes as we are likely to be at any time presented to, as are likely to be at any time presented to him, these notes come to have the same currency as gold or silver from the confidence that such money can at any time be had for them." Unquote. Smith discussed why trust in each other and establishing rules of behavior that generate such confidence is neither redundant nor is it automatically provided. He discussed why such confidence need not always pre-exist or survive so that a climate of mutual trust has to be cultivated and fostered. Even though the champions of the narrow reading of Smith enshrined in, in many economics book may be at a complete loss about how to understand the present economic crisis, since people still have excellent reason to seek more trade, like the baker and the butcher, more trade in, in the middle of the crisis, only they have far less opportunity. And one of the missing factors is, of course, the confidence in which the, the banks, of course, did a lot of terrible things, but they also lost trust. In, in, the, in, the, in the financial system. The devastating consequences of mistrust and the collapse of mutual confidence would not have puzzled Smith, who discussed the respective roles of different types of human motivations and the need for state regulation to curb the excesses of the search for profits, thereby, by the way, including both moral ethical reasoning as well as, 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 as moral psychology and, and, and and, 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 and social thinking, which influence our, 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 our ideas. Good economic reasoning cannot be guaranteed without taking adequate note of insight from other disciplines, from moral philosophy to social psychology. I will let's read my point about the relevance of other disciplines within the subject matter of a particular discipline by considering only economics. But similar points can be made about other disciplines as well. And some disciplines, like social choice theory, which I referred to earlier as something with the UBC, had flourished for a couple of decades through the 70s and 80s. That, of course, is quintessentially an interdisciplinary subject. It includes economics, it includes politics, it includes sociology, it includes 
mathematics. And, it, and that had been part and parcel of that discipline. So what I have to point out is that there are many subjects where within the corpus of the theory itself, they are interdisciplinary anyway. That's one reason. I come to the second now. If the relevance of many disciplines in the inner logic of, logic of particular disciplines is one reason for the importance of interdisciplinary studies, another reason is less about the subject matter of disciplines and more about the broadening of the nature of reasoning used in one discipline that can be obtained by considering methods of reasoning that other disciplines have found useful and productive. Since I quoted Smith earlier, let me refer to a general methodological argument that he, Smith, presented about looking beyond the parochial tradition surrounding one's thinking to understand the range and productivity of different kinds of methods and reasoning used in other disciplines that can be usefully invoked. That general concern would also give me the opportunity to make a few remarks uh, in this lecture on Rabindranath Tagore's rejection of parochial separatism. Smith used his own anti-parochial argument. By the way, before preparing this lecture, it never occurred to me how close, how parallel are some of Smith's thinking with that of Tagore. I don't think Tagore was aware of Smith writing much, at least I've seen no evidence of that. And Smith, of course, was dead by the time Tagore was born. Smith used it, um, uh, let me quote from Smith. He is in expressing skepticism here of relying on regional or cultural lo localism. And I would say that there's some skepticism here, though I have difficulty convincing my, all my friends in it, including Chuck Taylor and, uh, and, 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 Mart uh, and Michael Sandel, that it's a critique of communitarianism as well. But of course, Smith Smith. In developing the need to look beyond the limited boundaries of our habits of thought, we can never sur survey our own sentiments and motives. We can never form any judgment concerning them unless we remove ourselves, as it were, from our own natural station and endeavor to view them at a certain distance from us. But they, we can do this in no other way than by endeavoring to view them with the eyes of other people, or as other people are likely to view them." Unquote. This is a very general argument ev ev about avoiding the limits of boundaries in human thought and action, and it's against parochialism in general. In this case, it's applied to cultural parochialism, but it has relevance to disciplinary parochialism as well. In this argument against bounded and parochial thoughts, Smith would have found a strong ally in Rabindranath Tagore. Tagore's basic idea of education was grounded on reaching out across the barriers of culture, nationality, and discipline of thought. Of course, his main concern was not the methodology of higher education, but that of political, social, and cultural understanding and the understanding of our identities. He worked hard to break out of religious and communal thinking that was beginning to get some championing in India during his lifetime. It would peak in the years following his death in 1941 when the Hindu-Muslim riots suddenly erupted in the subcontinent. And that, of course, made the partitioning of the country hard to avoid. And yet the cultivated tension of that period of communal disharmony, disharmony, disharmony did ultimately pass. And even the part of Bengal that has been defined on religious lines as Muslim majority area to form what became East Pakistan would take a new identity by the early 1970s in the emerge of a secular and democratic Bangladesh emphasizing linguistic and cultural unity rather than religion divisions. With its independence, Bangladesh chose one of Tagore's song, Amar Shonar Bangla, as its national anthem, making Tagore possibly the only person in human history who has authored the national anthems of two independent countries. India had adopted another song of Tagore, Janagana Mana Adhinayaka, in 1947 as its national anthem. All this must be extremely confusing 
to those who see contemporary world as a clash of civilizations. With the Muslim civilization, the Hindu civilization, the Western civilization, and other such delineated groups defined largely on religious grounds, forcefully confronting each other. They would also be confused by Rabindranath Tagore's own description of his cultural background, of the cultural background of his family, which he described it as, I quote from Tagore, it is a confluence of three cultures, Hindu, Mohammedan, and British, unquote. Rabindranath's grandfather, Dwarakanath, was well known for his command over Arabic and Persian. And Rabindranath grew, grew up in a family atmosphere in which a deep knowledge of Sanskrit and ancient Hindu texts was combined with the learning of Islamic traditions as well as Persian literature. It's not so much that Rabindranath tried to produce or had an interest in producing a synthesis of the different religions as the great Mughal emperor Akbar had tried to achieve, but his outlook rebelled against separatism and parochialism. And I quote from Tagore now, whatever we understand and enjoy in human products instantly become ours, wherever they might have had their origin. I'm proud of my humanity when I can acknowledge the poets and artists of other countries as my own. Let me feel with unalloyed gladness that all the glories of man are mine." Unquote. Indeed, in Tagore's vision of the future of his country, and in fact the future of the world, he emphasized the need for capaciousness as inclusiveness as much as he focused on the importance of freedom and reasoning, which are uh, also among his major themes. In a moving, moving poem, Tagore out outlined his vision eloquently in describing what he longed for. This would be familiar to many of the Indians and perhaps Bangladeshis who are here because it's one of the most common poems of Tagore, would be tried to quote it in Calcutta and Dhaka, but since I'm in, uh, I'm in Vancouver, I can. And this is Tagore. Where the, mind without, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls. This is his vision. Just to add a bit of gossip, I did read it. You see, in, when you get the novel, you have to give a novel speech, but you have to also speak at, at dinner, which is much harder. Uh, <laughs> and I quoted this, among others. Um, it turned out that actually I wasn't the first to quote it at dinner. It was Chandra Shaker. When he got it, he had quoted it. But then I also gathered that, you know, I'm like Chandra Shaker, totally non-religious. But he is kind of quite powerfully non-religious in a way that I'm pretty powerless in everything, and including that. So he, the last line had, and that heaven of freedom, uh, let my country awake. I didn't like heaven, so he changed it. Chandra Shekhar, in that half of freedom, let my country awake. <laughs> the, the sense was the same, but it was a fantastic poem. The rejection of parochial separatism is a central feature of Rabindranath Tagore's approach to intellectual separation. And this applies as much to disciplinary sacred stirring, which we're discussing today, as it does to religious segregation or civilizational partitioning. If this reasoning is correct, then one of the more general arguments for interdisciplinary studies is precisely the removal of boundaries that generate artificial divisions that are ultimately counterproductive, no matter how useful they might initially be for the specialized and continue to be for the specialized pursuit of disciplinary knowledge. Rabindranath Tagore was not alive when the, as I said, when the Interdisciplinary Studies program was established at the UBC, but he would have needed little convincing in seeing the importance of an inclusive approach to education, like the one here at UBC, the anniversary of which we are celebrating today. Tegos' argument against being confined by quote-unquote narrow domestic walls is a perfectly general methodological point. I end by saying that I'm very grateful indeed for having this opportunity to be present here on this memorial occasion. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.